It's when a huckster takes some lies and makes them sound cautious by saying them in Congress or a mainstream outlet. So disinformation's origins are slightly Stop! Stop! Atrocious. Stop! Stop! Enough! Enough! Stop! I can't take it anymore. Sorry, sorry, sorry about that, folks. I know a lot of you had a long night, so let me apologize on behalf of Rowan and Rita for playing that clip, but... At least it wasn't the hole in the budget ad, right? <laughs> God, it's a hole in... Oh, never mind. Anyway, enough of that. But there is a reason why I did play that. And before we get back to talking about the elections, let me tell you about it. Now, if you were watching the show a couple of weeks ago, you might recall the old Scary Poppins over there, also known by her real name, Nina Jankowitz, was Joe Biden's pick to be the United States' his new disinformation czar. I know, Right. From First Amendment to official government narrative police in just 230 years. Well, big news. The office of the chief censor is no more, at least for the moment. Now, according to a report by Taylor Lorenz, a 30-something perpetually outraged journalist for The Washington Post, whose previous claim to fame was outing the anonymous citizen behind the brilliant libs of TikTok Twitter account, the Biden administration is pulling the pin. Now, here's where it all gets super ironic. Lorenz, in her story, blamed, quote, far-right influencers, oh, God, for pushing a fear campaign around the disinformation czar, which is a bit silly because her musical numbers are, frankly, scary enough. But it's also telling because to explain away the failure of the Biden administration to get up its anti-disinformation uh, organization, they clearly relied on the Washington Post to spread some more <laughs> disinformation. <laughs> now, Lorenz claims that Jankowitz, quote, has been subject to an unrelenting barrage of harassment and abuse while unchecked misrepresentations of her work continue to go viral. Oh, please. Yet the Washington Post, supposedly the ne plus ultra of journalism, doesn't back this up. As Stephen L. Miller wrote in the Washington Examiner this week, who coordinated these supposed brilliant online attacks against Jankowitz and forced Senate Democrats to cancel a hearing with her and pushed the Biden administration to cancel her entire gig? We also don't know that because Lorenz does not elaborate or back up that claim with evidence. Something you'd think would be quite important for a newspaper such as the Washington Post. Huh, who knew? Anyway, it doesn't take a genius to see what is really happening. The momentum in the culture wars, at least in the U.S., are finally starting to go on to the side of common sense. Other news from around the traps this week. Netflix, once one of the premier pipelines for pumping woke sewage into the culture, <laughs> has recently seen its share price tank. And after being mocked for a series about a man getting pregnant, has forced its employees to sign a statement that, that they cannot complain if, God forbid, they're forced to work on a Dave Chappelle show. <laughs> They've even had to cancel two Ibrahim X. Kendi animated shows. God, can you imagine that? They'd be even worse than that hole in the bucket ad, including a show called Anti-Racist Baby. Because, yes, even your baby is a racist who needs re-education. Meanwhile, the aforementioned Dave Chappelle is still outperforming after being attacked on stage. And Joe Rogan, remember all the confected controversy around him a few months ago? Still churning it out with 12.3 million subscribers and counting. That is especially true when it comes to the climate crisis, which is why we will work together and continue to work together to address these issues, to tackle these challenges, and to work together as we continue to work operating from the new norms, rules, and agreements that we will convene to work together on to galvanize Global action. Hey, thank you so much tonight for playing that clip because I'm very hungry. I've been working all day. I haven't had anything to eat. So a nice tasty word salad is just the thing to fill me up here. <laughs> Look, what a load of nonsense that was. If you put that sentence out and string it out and try and diagram it, it's just literally it is a bunch of post-it notes taken from the off the wall at a corporate retreat where they're trying to figure out the mission statement for a company that nobody knows what they do. It just doesn't make any sense. This woman, I remember when I was a kid and Dan Quayle was vice president, they said, oh, it's a heartbeat away, we've got this idiot. Well, Hello, now the left is like, oh, Kamala Harris, yeah, no, she's great. Yeah, this is all fine, nothing to see here. Joe Biden's shaking hands in midair, and then we've got this performance. Go figure. <laughs>
But how does raising taxes on corporations lower the cost of gas, the cost of a used car, the cost of food for everyday Americans? So look, I think we encourage those who have done very well, right, especially those who care about climate change uh, to support a fair ta tax code. Well, that makes no sense at all. <laughs> funny information by caring about climate change. Oh, maybe we'll do I mean, that here. Yeah, well, <laughs> look at Australia. But it is unhinged. And just reflect, this administration is responsible for overseeing the world's largest economy. Now, if what you just saw doesn't scare you, then I don't think anything will. It's pretty ugly. The net, there it is, 11.29. That's not, not where you want to be at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The NASDAQ was looking even worse. The S&P, no pretty picture either. Nothing has changed on how we see the stock market. Uh, we do not, that's not something that we keep an eye on every day. The removal of sonnets that are too white and Western, James. Well, in fact, it's not just the, those few sonnets, it's actually all sonnets. Ah, so at right. the University of Salford in England, uh, outside Manchester, um, teaching the sonnet is no longer a thing that they're going to do because, you know, that's a patriarchal form and it's colonial. A sonnet is colonial. So if I say, shall I compare thee to a summer's day or anything like that, apparently I'm um, being racist and patriarchal and all sorts of things like that. Um, yeah, so one more classical form by the wayside of wokeness. One interesting thing that we're going to see here is that rather than the teals pulling the country to the left, in some ways, especially if it's in a um, coalition with labor, they could pull Albo to the right on certain economic issues. They may be the best hope of our keeping our state's three <laughs> tax cuts because those seats are all about self-interest. Advertising was just absolutely non-existent. Awful. You look at 2019. Remember the great ads that they had? The, uh, Bill Shorten, the Bill Australia Can't Afford. Yeah. That was an yeah, excellent exactly. ad. But, you know, the bucket ad, the golem, there was no, the social media game was very, very weak. Mm. Um, and, you know, they did a good job, I think, pushing out a lot of good sort of stories um, about labor and what labor would be like. You know, they had a, they pushed very hard on the number of criminals uh, that were released from immigration detention by labor when they were in power. But they never capitalized that with an advertising campaign. And mm. I felt like they were almost running scared from that in the bigger picture. Again, you know, it's almost as if people have forgotten after 10 years what it was like. Well, they're going to get reminded again. I'm delighted to have in the studio with us the best candidate the Liberals put forward at this election, Catherine Deves. Catherine, great to see you. How Your sort of values, sensible, common sense values uh, versus these sort of moderate left squishy values. Look around. You had a 4.7 swing against you, uh, according to the current count. North Sydney, Trent Zimmerman, 13% swing against him. Yes. yes. In McKellar. Um, uh, Jason Falinski, 16.4% swing against him with Sophie Scomps. Now, to me, that says that the moderates, nobody's buying what they're selling anymore. Yep. What do you think about that? Well, I think I started uh, an argument and <clears throat> with respect to this brand of fe feminism that is predicated on victimhood. We have these people prosecuting this argument about feminism and there are only worthy victims. They get to choose who the worthy victims are. And if you go against their prevailing dogma, uh, then they will metaphorically burn you at the stake, and then they'll resurrect you, and then they'll burn you at the stake again. And I think with me getting out there uh, and pointing out that there are issues with this so-called modern feminism where they can't even identify what a woman is, mm. uh, I think the ordinary Australian people resonated with that, and that is why I had so much support around the country and... And do, you think, and do you think that this now, because the New South Wales state government has been so dominated by people like Matt Keane and others who are essentially holding Dom Perrottet a hostage, do you think that all of this is actually going to bode poorly for them next year when they go to, to an election? Look, if there's going to be a, a reckoning at federal level, which obviously there is, I would not be surprised if it happens at the state level. But I think that the Liberal Party needs to get back to its Liberal values and maybe this has started that.